Hello and welcome. Tonight, Outray Trails continued gridlock on the Lagos Ibadan Expressway as residents of Isheria State protest against the dangers created by the road reconstruction. Federal Ministry of Works appeals for patience. Supporters of the Labour Party in Rivers and Benway State take to the streets to rally support for the presidential candidate, Peter B. Another group in the nation's capital, Abuja, says APC presidential candidate, Bola Tinubu, is the right man for the job. Army dismisses two soldiers led to have killed a Yobe state-based cleric, Sheikh Goni Aismami, after a board of inquiry set up to investigate the matter found them guilty. Pakistan Prime Minister laments ravaging flood in his country, says the magnitude of the calamity worse than expected. And on business news tonight, Nigeria's central bank projects 30% increase in cross-border trade as it commences third phase of the Inara project implementation. sisters Serena and Venus to play doubles together at the US Open in what is expected to be the final tournament in Serena's career. Up their experiences flying the Lagos Ibado Expressway for some time. But today, the residents of Isheri area of Lagos expressed their outrage over the continued gridlock on the road. It's been a big struggle for motorists flying the expressway owing to the rehabilitation, which has created diversions resulting in daily traffic jam. The residents want the federal government to provide alternative routes while work continues. Residents of Isheri, Opic area of Lagos, are protesting the Lagos Ibadan Expressway rehabilitation, which is affecting free flow of movement. <laughs> Motorists have been experiencing gridlock for over two months since contractors Julius Berger comments the renewed construction work from Opic all the way to the old toll gate. The traffic gridlock here is man-made. It is surmountable. We have approached Julius Baga in the past to appeal to them to create alternatives. Surprisingly, we were, we were told yesterday that they have blocked this place. We got here to discover that the only turning point after Kara had been blocked, and the stampede was so bad yesterday that we lost a, a sickling daughter of a resident in the traffic. I've never seen anywhere in the world where they will be doing road, there will be no be traffic management. Judas Baja did not provide that. We have, our residents have been attacked separately on this road because of uh, road uh, mismanagement. So we are appealing to the Minister of Works to ensure that this road is properly managed, especially because there are over 500,000 residents around this community. We need the government to kindly listen to the cry of the citizens. You know, in the case that we have citizens spending hours, hitting hours on the road, it's, it's uncalled for. And um, resumption is just around the corner. We cannot expose our kids to this suffering. Both inbound and outbound Lagos have become a driver's nightmare with motorists spending several hours on the road. The government of Ogun State and that of Lagos should find a lasting solution to this gridlock. The Julius Baker is not helping the matters either. The, the stretch is too long. They should have blocked the road in intervals. Let the federal government find something to do. This is not Julius Berger. They are fake. Now I'm going for delivery and since almost three hours I've been on the road from just the long bridge only to this place. We need help. 
Nigeria need help. We don't know what to do again. Uh, 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 Campaign is that they are not campaigning, but yet we are not seeing anything. Look at how we are suffering. Since seven o'clock, since seven a.m., we have been in this place. Members of the Federal Road Safety Corps and other officials are on ground trying to clear the congestion. While the rehabilitation work continues, other parts of the road are getting destroyed, which is slowing down movement of vehicles. Commuters plying the Lagos Ibadan Expressway will be hoping that the federal government reacts to their demands as soon as possible. Meanwhile, the highway director in charge of the Southwest and the Federal Ministry of Works and Housing, Mr. Adeda Molakuti, has been explaining the factors that led to the gridlock on the Lagos Ibado Expressway. Speaking to Channel Television in Abuja, Mr. Kuti explains that motorists will choose to drive against traffic and some will try to circumvent the traffic management in place on the road are responsible for the gridlock. While apologizing for all the inconveniences the situation has caused commuters, he appeals for understanding of road users on this route. The major problem we've been experiencing on that road basically has been, you know, breakdown of vehicles, you know, breaking down of vehicles, trucks, and then the indiscipline aspect on the part of a lot of drivers those who drive against traffic. Where we walk now, we are walking at two sections. One is very close to, that's the section that is close to Otetela Bridge to the beginning, to uh, Chene 00, that's around seven up there. And then we are also walking around that OPIC. Both gangs, both teams are on the inward Lagos. Inward Lagos. But you see, some of these drivers, when they are coming in into Lagos, I think somewhere around Warewa area, they try to play a smart one by going, by driving against traffic, going towards, coming, uh, using that there's an edge road. They now drive on that edge road with the intention of coming out at Opik, you know, thereby creating confusion at that junction. Ours is to construct the road make the necessary diversion. As a matter of fact, we will plan, we get our traffic management plan, and we get it approved. So once we get it approved, and of course, before you get your traffic management plan, it's, you know, usually we carry out our plan with, um, alongside Federal Road Safety Commission, as well as either Trace or LASMA in Lagos. So the thing is, and then they have their personnel on ground. We are really very, very sorry for what happened. I want to also use this opportunity to appeal to drivers. You know, let drivers keep to their lane. No matter what, you don't need to, once you keep to your lane, we shall get to our, we shall get to our destination. The key word there is keeping to your lane. Let everybody be lane disciplined. And then we already have, on, on, on standby, we have trucks in case there is any breakdown of vehicles or trucks. There are trucks there to pull them off the road. Ahead of the official kickoff of campaigns by political parties, their supporters in different parts of the country have been organizing and given indication of what to expect in the coming months. In the River State capital, Port Harcourt today, supporters of the Labour Party presidential candidate, Mr. Peter Obi, trooped out in their numbers in what they tagged a two million man march to rally support for their principal. The obedience, as they are called, defied the heavy downpour as they marched from LMA to Isaac Borough Park, shutting down traffic in the process. The excited group was addressed by a Nollywood actress, Hilda Dukubo. A similar scenario also played out in Makodi, the Benway state capital, where one of the leaders of the group spoke on why they are mobilizing support for the Labour Party ahead of the 2023 general elections. A political support group, Tinubu Presidential Ambassadors of Nigeria and Diaspora, believes the presidential candidate of the All Progressives Congress, APC, Ola Ahmed Tinubu, is the most qualified person to replace President Muhammad Buhari in 2023. The national coordinator of the group, Mr. Yusuf Hassani, stated this in Abuja 
on the sidelines of the official unveiling and inauguration of the group's national executives. Senator Bola Ahmed Tinubu is the most suitable candidate currently that every Nigerian citizen should support and vote for as the next president of the Federal Republic of Nigeria come 2023 general elections. The Jagaban is a leader of all leaders, not by accident, but by his unrelenting investments on human resources. He is a master planner, a pathfinder, a strategist, goal getter, which for sight to identify potentials and bringing out the best in them, while others are busy finding faults. Ashua Jubala Ahmad Tinubu is busy strategizing the next phase of life, not for himself alone. But the larger society, he is a leader who knows when to talk and when to be silent. For the presidential candidate of the Social Democratic Party, Mr. Adewole Adebayo, the prevailing security situation in Nigeria has lingered for far too long. He's, however, given reasons for the situation. According to him, a caucus inside the government profits financially from the menace, and as such, they allow it to spread and linger to sustain their flow of income. He mentioned this in the nation's capital, Abuja. There is a caucus inside the Nigerian government that believes that the insecurity is an opportunity to spend money. And that if the insecurity expands and expands, so you spend money on internal security, so you go around the country, you see um, purely theatrical checkpoints where you can say I deploy uh, 200,000 men, even though all the men under you are not up to 20,000. So you collect all the money and feeding allowance and all of that, maybe they will think, oh, I'm not killing anybody. But by allowing the security to extend, in order for such steady income to extend, they're actually contributing more to the problems than they're solving it. And that insecurity, it's serious enough when somebody hijacks a train and takes passengers away, that's serious. But the artificial poverty that we're experiencing in the country is because a lot of our resources the government is pretending, because I don't think government can be that powerless. The government is pretending that they have no control over our maritime assets. So ships, heavy ships, run by international companies that are well-known, that have home governments, come to our land and take millions of barrels of crude oil. So at a time when our currency is supposed to be very strong, when uh, oil price is up, we don't have any income. So those are the things that make it look like as formidable as our armed forces are, a security agency that will look like we can't handle basic problem. It looks like there's a convergence of interest between those who are causing insecurity and those who are put in charge of it. Now let's hear from one of the group leaders who participated in the match for the Labour Party presidential candidate, Mr. Peter Obi, in Amakodi, the Benue state capital. The aim of this one million man match is to uh, create an awareness about Peter Obi and also to create awareness about the logo, uh, the Labour Party logo. A lot of people do not know what the Labour Party logo is. so. The coalition team up consisting of all the groups in Bendel State and bring up the idea that we will mobilize ourselves, march uh, in some major areas to create the awareness. A lot of people do not know that Peter B is in Labour Party, so we try to create the awareness. That is the major M, the H range between uh, Peter B and the other uh, uh, contestants. We discovered that there is a very large gap. So this time around, we don't want someone who is um, old, extremely old 
to be at the number one seat. So we are looking at someone who is closer to us. Although there are some other presidential candidates that are younger than Peter Obi, but we are looking at someone who has a stake, someone who is likely to win. And we find out that Peter Obi is the right person. In part two, after the break, Chief of Air Staff urges Nigerians to support the military as it intensifies the fight against insurgency and other criminal activities in the country. That's in a moment. Join us again. Channel Television broadcasting live from Lagos. So a reminder of our top stories. Outrage trails continued gridlock on the Lagos Ibado Expressway as residents of Isheria State protest against the dangers created by the road reconstruction. Federal Ministry of Work appeals for patience. Supporters of the Labour Party in Rivers and Benway State take to the streets to rally support for presidential candidate Peter Obi. Another group in Abuja says APC presidential candidate Bola Tinubu is the right man for the job. Army dismisses two soldiers alleged to have killed Yobe State-based cleric Sheikh Goni Aisami after a board of inquiry set up to investigate the matter found them guilty. Pakistan Prime Minister laments ravaging flood in his country, says magnitude of the calamity worse than expected. The Chief of Air Staff, Air Marshal Oladayo Amao, says the armed forces need the support of Nigerians to succeed in its efforts at defeating terrorism, banditry and other criminal elements around the country. Air Marshal Amao says the Nigerian Air Force has procured more equipment and is training its airmen and women to handle them for delivery of maximum results in various areas of operations. The Air Chief was speaking at a reception in honor of his predecessor, retired Air Marshal Sadiq Abubakar in Abuja. This is ex exemplified by my vision for the Nigerian Air Force, which is to enhance and sustain critical air power capability required for joint force employment in pursuit of national security imperatives. This vision is largely a continuation of the laudable... In the meantime, the Nigerian Army has dismissed Lance Corporal John Gabriel and Lance Corporal Adamu Gideon, suspected to have murdered an Islamic cleric, Sheikh Goni Aisami, in Yobe State. Earlier, the police had handed over the suspect to the army to conduct his own investigation on the involvement in the killings. The acting commanding officer in charge of 241 Reese Battalion, Nguru in Yobe State, Lieutenant Colonel Ibrahim Osabu, told journalists that a joint board of inquiry with police was set up to investigate the matter and found them guilty. He explained further that the two soldiers were dismissed on a two-count charge and will be prosecuted by the police in a court of law. This is the second phase of what transpired. The first phase was we initiated a military police investigation together with the Nigerian police and the report afforded them, gave us the latitude to, to sanction them based on the sections of our Armed Forces Act. And now they are officially dismissed regiment from the Nigerian Army. We are taking them to our sector headquarters in Damaturu, which the sector will now hand them officially to the Nigerian police so that they can face the civil 
prostitution. Obviously, this men can never represent us. We are being paid by the Nigerian taxpayers' money to hold guns and defend this country. But what these soldiers did is not a true reflection of the Nigerian army personnel. Now, the acting commander of commanding officer in charge of the 241 Aris Battalion in Guru in Yobe State, Lieutenant Colonel Ibrahim Osabu, has told journalists about how a joint board of inquiry set up with the police to investigate the matter of two men of its men, Lance Corporal John Gabriel and Lance Corporal Adamu Gideon, have been dismissed from the force. In Brown New State, the police have paraded a 46-year-old mother of two linked to the abduction of three children in Medugri, the state capital. She was paraded alongside 58 other suspects said to specialize in kidnapping and other crimes. The suspected female kidnapper said she indulged in the act for the first time, adding that she was lured into it by a particular lady in Lagos who promised to take her abroad and make her wealthy. She put me inside moto and she gave me some things to put inside my mouth as I was going. She said she, said she has been helping women to travel outside country, that she's going to help me, that I should not tell my husband, that if I tell him that I'm going to die, that I should not talk. From there, she now took me to river. They gave me something. The day I will come, she took me, to, she called a, a somebody. The person now do some kind ritual and give me, say she will send me a message. Say once I reach there, I should forget every other thing and now she now gave me 500,000, sir. She's a lady B. She said I should bring children for her, that I will see children, that I should just carry them. She gave me something to put in my mouth, say I should bring the children. Now let's listen to what the Chief of Air Staff, Air Marshal Oladayo Amau, had to say about the armed forces which needs everyone's support to succeed in its efforts at defeating terrorism, banditry and other criminal elements around the country. He mentioned this in the nation's capital, Abuja. This is exemplified by my vision for the Nigerian Air Force, which is to enhance and sustain critical air power capability required for joint force employment in pursuit of national security imperatives. This vision is largely a continuation of the laudable initi initiatives achieved by the Air Marshal S.B. Abubakar retired. For instance, we have continued in the robust training of our personnel in the cardinal activities towards driving the achievement of my vision. We have also continued on the sustained drive for platform acquisitions and maintenance in order to ensure adequate availability of platforms to meet our national security imperatives. The Air Marshal, sir. I also want to assure you that the Nigerian Air Force we continue to be willing, able, and ready to promote unity, faith, peace, and progress of our dear country, Nigeria. <laughs> Permit me at this point to seize the opportunity to call on all Nigerians to continue to support the Nigerian Air Force, and indeed the armed forces of Nigeria, to discharge their duty to, of protecting lives and properties, as well as the territorial integrity of our beloved country. A teenager identified as Mildred Joshua Ebuka, who went missing in Lagos, has been found in Bochi State. According to a statement by the Bochi State Police Command, the 17-year-old girl had left her home in Victoria Island, Lagos, to deliver a wig cap to her aunt's friend in Ikorudu. On the way, she was said to have boarded a commercial bus, but the teenager was later found at a bus park in Bochi and brought into police custody by a good Samaritan as she could not recognize her environment. The police further explains that Miss Mildred speaks English fluently, wore a light blue blouse and trouser, she's fair in complexion and has no tribal marks. 
to other stories now. The much-anticipated 5G telecommunication network, which had before now been launched in other parts of the world, has finally birthed in Nigeria. After one of the two vendors which won the bid to provide the service rolled it out on August the 24th. In this next report, our technology correspondent, Victor Mathias, takes a look at the journey before its birth, challenges, and how it will aid Nigeria's target of achieving 70% broadband penetration by 2025. It's been four months since the Nigerian Communications Commission confirmed issuance of the final letters of award of the fifth generation spectrum licenses to interested telecom service operators. And now, the technology, already live in most countries abroad, is up and running in Nigeria. However, one of the vendors, MTN, responsible for the rollout, is yet to fully implement 100% 4G coverage, and its CEO has only expressed optimism to reach 80% by the end of 2022, as the company switches its attention to 5G. Although the NCC did not say what the criteria for selecting those to handle the rollout of the latest network generation is, experts believe a vista of opportunities has been opened. One of the benefits of 5G technology is that it has a hundred times the capacity of 4G technology theoretically. But basically it holds the promise of being able to deliver high quality broadband to more Nigerians than ever before. The 5G has several frequencies that it can work on. from as low as 6 gigahertz to as high as 60 gigahertz. So any operator can walk in any of these frequencies and that gives them the opportunity to leverage the pipeline to now deliver services. Then the speed is a lot faster. Industry analysts have also been clearing the air on the equipment to be used. Um, most of the airports that will be close to 5G deployment have not been recalibrated for 5G towers or 5G radio emissions. So there might be some uh, interference with already existing um, aviation transmission technologies. When the Gs change, it doesn't, nothing changes about, you're still dealing with the same type of antenna. Now what you may see is that there may be more antennas on the, on the towers and you may see them in more places. But that's because the level of service required to deliver simple voice versus high-speed video is very, very different. So the networks will get denser. <laughs> the health effects of the 5G technology on humans has always been a cause for concern for many, but those fears have been delayed by medical experts, including the WHO, which concluded that after much research performed, no adverse health effect has been causally linked with exposure to wireless technologies. Health-related conclusions are drawn from studies performed across the entire radio spectrum and provided that the overall exposure remains below international guidelines, no consequences for public health are anticipated. In fact, uh, Aru, Adimora, and Mwanko, uh, both all, all three of them Nigerian researchers, uh, made a, they, did, they went to investigate at uh, this to see how much damage this could do to the uh, human DNA. And they found uh, that there's no substantial evidence uh, to, to dictate or to say that there will be uh, any harmful uh, effect or any change to the uh, human DNA. Data from the Nigerian Communications Commission show that Nigeria's broadband penetration increased from 40.9% in February 2022 to 44.5% in July 2022. Now this is a significant rise from what was obtainable five years ago as penetration has grown from 19.78% in July 2017 to 44.5% in July 2022. But will this rollout aid Nigeria's target of 70% broadband penetration by 2025? I would say no. We need to now ask ourselves the question, how does this now begin to affect the lives of the ordinary Nigerians? Because as it is now, the ordinary Nigerian can't even afford the devices to connect to the 5G network. I hope that we'll see that in a very short period of time. And I hope that it will be a collaborative effort, not the usual business model of competing against each other, each other that we've been used to. The NCC has listed limited frequencies with the required spectral efficiency, skilled professionals with requisite knowledge of the technology, fewer 5G-enabled devices, and cost of deployment amongst others as challenges that might be faced during the rollout phase. So far, the rollout has only taken effect in 190 sites spread across Abuja and Lagos with the hope of spreading to other cities in the future when other telecommunications entities acquire the requisite equipment and license to roll out.
Victor Mathias, Channels Television News. To discuss this further, we have the Chief Executive Officer of Internet Exchange Port Point of Nigeria, Mr. Mohammed Rodman. A pleasure having you with us on the News at 10. Thank you. I'm delighted to be here. Now, how would you react to the rollout of this technology in Nigeria? Um, it's an excellent initiative by the regulators and the telecommunication companies that were licensed for this. I think this is a welcome development. But how realistic is the deployment of 5G technology in the whole country? Um, honestly, even as government, um, when they did the national broadband plan from 2020 to 2025, there was no um, 5G rollout in that because they mostly focused on 4G. Um, as you know, 5G is the latest technology. It will take some years uh, for us to have much coverage across Nigeria. If you remember, MTN started um, 4G in their network in 2016, and um, there was a, a, a telecommunication company called Smile that started operating on 4G uh, in 2014. But unfortunately, up to now, I think we're around 60 to 70 percent coverage of the 4G network. So for 5G, I think it will take another um, years for us to see deployment of 5G. And considering the the what is it called? Um, the economic terrain of Nigeria, because this is a business when they deploy 5G, um, they are looking for business. And uh, 5G enabled devices are expensive. The minimum you can get now is maybe $100 for a Chinese product. So therefore it's within, um, it's, um, it's, it's too expensive for Nigerians. Considering that 91 million Nigerians are below the poverty line uh, based on the current statistics. So you think that looking at the equipment is going to be really affordable for the man on the street? No, I said it's, it's too expensive. Right. The 5G devices, exactly. That's why right now they are focused in areas where uh, people have high purchasing power in Lagos, in Abuja, in Kano. Uh, in those areas specifically where they feel people can afford the data, it's not only ab about affording the devices, it's also affording the data because you now have extremely high speed how many Nigerians can subscribe to this huge data bundles? So if they are looking for quick return of investment. Therefore, they will start from the um, high bro areas, you know, urban areas, before they can now look at other areas where um, the general populace can use it. But you know, some people are still complaining about the 3G and 4G technology. What do you have to say about that? And now we're looking at the 5G. Do you think it's realistic? No, as I said, you see, there are only two companies that are licensed in this. One is MTN, of course, the leading network in Nigeria, and more have telecommunications, which do not have any infrastructure on ground for now. Um, the reality is for MTN, they, they are looking at a, a network of the future. They are planning towards that. But realistically, we should be looking at 3G and 4G across Nigeria, because that is what Nigerians can afford for now. And it's much cheaper to deploy than 5G, because 5G works on micro cell sites, and therefore you need to replicate a lot of cell sites across Nigeria. Where an existing cell site covers huge area of space, um, for 5G, it's, it's just a micro, micro cell site, maybe 100 um, meters squared radius, and therefore you need to deploy a lot of cell sites. And all over the world, there is security, there is electricity, and they use, for example, um, light poles, street light poles to deploy 5G. But in Nigeria, you can't do that, because there is no electricity in those uh, light poles. And, therefore, and there is also a uh, security consideration. So that is a major challenge. That's why for almost all the cell sites in Nigeria, they are protected with security. Uh, they have to take diesel to that, and diesel is expensive. They have to, impact, uh, in fact, uh, protect the vehicles as they move the, um, the diesel to the cell site. So it's not going to be that realistic to deploy across Nigeria. So we should be a little bit patient. I think in a few years to come, 5G will, will become a bit uh, dominant. The Chief Executive Officer, Internet Exchange Point of Nigeria, Mr. Mohammed Rodman. A pleasure sharing your thoughts with us on the news at 10. Thank you so much. Thank you. There is a 50%
school dropout between primary six and senior secondary one in Edo State, a situation Governor Godwin Obaseki says will be addressed by his flagship educational development program, Edo Best 2.0. According to him, the program allows proper planning and development of basic education using an evidence and performance-based strategy. Mr. Obaseki was speaking after inspecting the new era college in Benin City, the Edo State Capital. That's one of the schools set for the proposed upgrade in the state's educational system. What we're trying to do first is to just align what we're doing with the national educational policy to say these are the number of basic schools, P1 to GSS3 we have in Edo State. These are the allocations. This is the minimum standard of teaching, of learning, of infrastructure, and ensuring that we have access. And this is how we check to make sure that these children are learning. And this is what we expect when a child has spent nine years in our school system. For those who want to now proceed, go on to senior secondary school or technical, we also have a very clear cut out plan on what the expectations are. For instance, we want to, we're hoping that this school, Nira, will be a senior secondary school. You know? So you come here for three years. Uh, so what should be the minimum standard? And by the time you're living in three years time, what do we expect of you? What we have noticed from the analysis that is going on now with education, we notice that by the, between the time a child takes a primary six exams, the number, the enrollment from primary six to enrollment in JSS, in SS1, we lose 50% of our pupils. Do you understand? There is an attrition rate of almost 50% from primary six to SS. So these kids, they don't go to school after that. That's what you see in the motor parks, that's what you see in all, and that is what we want to fix. Party presidential candidate Mr. Peter Obi trooped out in their numbers in Port Harcourt, the River State capital, today in what they tagged a two million man march to rally support for their principal. The obedience, as they are called, defied the heavy downpour as they marched through LMA to Isaac Borough Park, shutting down traffic in the process. The excited group were addressed, was addressed by a Nollywood actress. Hilda Bukubo. The excess crude account was established in 2004 with the primary objective to protect Nigeria's economy against shortfalls caused by crude oil price volatility. However, with the almost complete depletion of the reserve funds, Nigeria's future budgets could be impacted, especially since underperformance and crude oil theft have dwindled the amount of earnings in recent years. Our next report takes a look at what the government must do to shore up the reserve in the excess crude account. The balance in Nigeria's excess crude account has reduced significantly from $35.7 million it was as at June 2022 to $376,655 as at July 25, 2022. These were some of the headlines in major newsstands as Nigerians tried to wrap their heads around why the funds have been depleting so fast with lack of commensurate results that can be traced to contributing to the nation's economy. In 2015, the Minister of Finance had explained that state governors in consultations with the National Economic Council are aware of withdrawals from the excess crude accounts. Because of the volatility in the crude oil market, we have not had any accretion to the excess crude account. So what we have had has been gradually used up for different purposes and it's always used in consultation with the uh, National Economic Council, that is the governor's, because this is a federation account. The last approval 
that was given by the National Economic Council was one billion U.S. dollars to enhance security. Despite the rally in the price of crude oil in previous years, Nigeria's excess crude account dipped to $35.7 million in the previous year and has now fallen to a record low of 376,000 since the peak period recorded in 2012 at $11.5 billion during the Good Luck Jonathan administration. Nigeria's excess crude account has dipped by almost 100%. In 2017, a report by the Natural Resource Governance Institute ranked Nigeria's excess crude account as the most poorly governed sovereign wealth fund among 33 resource-rich countries in the world. Also, in April 2019, the International Monetary Fund, IMF, ranked Nigeria as the world's second worst country in the use of sovereign wealth funds, following Qatar. Nobody can ascertain the withdrawals and the deposit in the excess crude account for some years for now. And the problem is that the government dips hand into it and they take funds from it at will because there is no necessary regulatory approvals to be taken. So that has allowed the SS Cook account to be continuously diminished, uh, to, de to be depleted to the extent that in July this year it went as low as $376,000. And we can recall that around 2009, the SS school was in excess of $20 billion. So it's a very serious situation, and this has been able to happen because of governance issues. There is no controls. The state governors ensure that they draw and draw from it at will. Since its creation, the excess crude account has been the subject of controversies and allegations of corruption. But what is the way forward? There should be a legal backing for it. You don't just arbitrarily set up an account for a federation without any legal backing. It's very important for legal backing. They need to push it through the National Assembly. Dialogue backs it up, and all the appropriate transparency modalities are followed. The nation's excess crude account continues to generate heated debates in many quarters. Nigerians, however, insist that the appropriate use of the funds will save the nation's economy in the event of any eventualities. We return to the story of the teenager who went missing in Lagos but has now been found in Bochi State. The police command in Bochi says they have contacted her parents who told them that they will be in Bochi to pick up their child. The police said the 17-year-old girl had left her home in Victoria Island, Lagos to deliver a wig cap to her aunt's place in Ikorodu. On the way, she was said to have boarded a commercial bus, but was later found at a bus park in Bochi and was brought into police custody by a good Samaritan. Rhapsody of Realities, a daily devotional produced by the Love World Publishing Limited, has now been translated even into seven thousand languages. The director of operations Love World Publishing, Lola Aisida, announced this at a press conference in Lagos. She added that the milestone will be celebrated at a global program tagged Reach Out World Live with Pastor Chris on September the 2nd and 3rd. Rhapsody of Realities, a publication of Love World Publishing Limited, a daily devotional authored by Pastor Chris Oyakilome of the Christ Embassy Church, is now said to be the most translated book in the world. To announce this milestone at top members of the church and its publishing arm. Rhapsody of Reality is one of our flagship products in our Love World Publishing stable has now been translated into 7,000 languages. That makes Rhapsody of Realities the number one most translated book in the whole world. It's our greatest honor and joy to have achieved the translation of Rhapsody of Realities in 7,000 languages of the world. We're well on our way to have the devotional in all the living languages of the world. To celebrate this milestone, Christ Embassy is organizing a global gathering on September the 2nd and 3rd, 2022. It is for this reason that we are gathering Africans, non-Africans alike, and people all over the world 
we're showcasing the impact of the 7,000 languages. And you're going to hear the stories, the impact, this devotional that is being published by Love World Publishing, authored by the man of God, Pastor Chris, has transcended into every nation. For the church, this is the power of obedience that has given birth to purpose. The man of God was given, was directed to author this book, to bring men back on track to their creator, giving them an inheritance, bringing them into their inheritance. To show that this devotional is a tool in the hand of God, there are a myriad of testimonies. We have something to celebrate, and we've got something to shout about. This book transformed my life. Till date, I still use the rhapsodies of realities. 22 years after the Love World Publishing rolled out its first edition of the Rhapsody of Realities, many say that the devotional has had tangible results in supernatural transformation in the lives of people who live under its daily influence. The next question of translations. Time to find out what's happening in the world of business with Laddie Williams. Thanks, Melinda. In business news, the Central Bank of Nigeria is projecting a 30% increase in cross-border trade when the implementation of the third phase of the Inara project commences. Uh, speaking at a meeting with Inara merchants in Abuja, the Deputy Governor, the Central Bank in charge of economic policy, uh, Dr. Kingsley Obiora also announced a reward scheme for Enara merchants as well as subscribers of the Enara wallet as part of its campaign towards boosting uh, the use of the platform. The implementation of cross-border transactions in phase three of the Enara project is expected to increase cross-border trade by about 30 percent. Furthermore, Lower transaction costs is expected to increase the usage, that is, transmission of volume and value of Vinaira, and improve income generation by businesses. In this vein, I am pleased to inform you that the bank recently approved a reward scheme for merchants and other users of the Vinaira. The bank will support merchants with some promotional materials, subsidize the current merchant service charge by 50%, and accelerate nationwide sensitization, which early business adopters of the e-Naira can leverage on to market this wider adoption. It is imperative to note that the e-Naira platform can now facilitate payments using QR codes USSD, Wallet ID, and Inaira Wallet Type. And now to the markets. Uh, trading activity at the Forex market was mostly positive this week as the total turnover of transactions uh, carried out at the FX spot forwards and futures markets uh, rose by 88.45% to $922.79 million as of August the 26th. Uh, the further breakdown of uh, trading results shows that total value of transactions at the FX spot market rose by 56.32% to $607.57 million, while transactions at the FX derivatives market rose by 212% to $315.22 million. Meanwhile, the local currency went up by 0.03% to 427 naira, 81 against the dollar at the Nigerian Autonomous Foreign Exchange window of the Forex market. In contrast, the 427 Naira 94 Cobra recorded last week. And at the local equities market, investor sentiments ended the fourth trading week of August with moderate comeback as the uh, benchmark index rose by 0.63%. At the same time, the market's capitalization increased by 167 billion Naira uh, to close at 26,797, uh, recouping uh, some of the losses it recorded in the start of the week. The uptrend is largely attributed to the gains recorded by telecom giant Airtel and some other high-value equities while the market consolidated its rebound in the final two trading sessions this week. Meanwhile, sectoral activity was mostly negative as four out of the five key sectors of the NGX ended in the red. 
Activity levels also ended negative against the previous week's performance. And uh, NEM Insurance led a pack of 27 gainers with 30.89% increase on its share price. Our northern Nigeria flour mills is uh, number one among 28 other losers. While the trio of mutual benefits, FBN Holdings and Axis Bank were major contributors to the 914.44 million uh, total volume of shares traded this week. Meanwhile, trading activities at the unlisted securities market also ended the fourth week of August in the green as the NESD uh, OTC exchange security index recorded a 0.19% advance. At the same time, the market capitalization went up by 100 million naira to close the week at 1 trillion naira, while uh, year-to-day returns increased by 2.43%. However, the total value of securities traded during the week decreased by 94.35% as the market recorded a total of 178 0.54 million naira in value against 304.04 million naira uh, in the previous week. At the same time, total volume of securities traded on the exchange decreased by 89.41% to 1.82 million units, while deals dropped 4% uh, this week. And that's uh, business news. It's back to Melinda with the rest of the news. Now let's find out what's happening in the world of sports with Victor Mathias. Thank you, Melinda, and welcome to Sports News. Now let's begin from the English Premier League, where Manchester United ended a dismal sequence of seven straight away defeats as they secured a narrow 1-0 win at Southampton, courtesy of a 55th-minute goal scored by captain Bruno Fernandes. Elsewhere, Brentford and Everton settled for a one-all draw at the GTEC Community Stadium, while Brighton defeated Leeds United 1-0 with Pascal Gross getting on the score sheet in the 66th minute at the American Express Community Stadium. In other matches, Tanman Chelsea defeated Leicester City 2-1. Liverpool secured their first victory this season after hammering Bournemouth 9-0 in a one-sided encounter at Anfield. Defending champions Manchester City fought back from two goals down to beat Crystal Palace 4-2, courtesy of a Bernal Silva goal and an Erling Haaland hat-trick. In the last game of the day, Arsenal came from behind to beat Fulham 2-1 at the Emirates. Goals from Martin Odegaard and Brazil defender Gabriel ensured the Gunners secured maximum points today. In tennis, Serena Williams will play alongside older sister Venus in the U.S. Open doubles in what will be the final tournament of her career. The Williams sisters have won 14 major double titles and three Olympic gold medals together. Serena will retire after the U.S. Open, which starts in New York on Monday. Their first Grand Slam title together came at the 1999 French Open. And Japan's Naomi Osaka believes the pressure she has put on herself to turn around her on-court struggles in time for the U.S. Open has left her very anxious heading into the year's final Grand Slam. Osaka's hard-court swing leading into the U.S. Open has been rough as she lost in the second round in San Jose, retired from her first round match in Toronto with a back injury and fell at the first hurdle in Cincinnati. A Nigeria senior men's basketball team, the Tigers, bounced back from defeat with the win in the FIBA Basketball World Cup qualifiers in Abidjan, the capital of Cote d'Ivoire. Nigeria beat Guinea 89 points to 70 in a keenly contested encounter played at the Palais de Sports de Trècheville in Abidjan. Nigeria's next game will be against Angola on Sunday. And that's a wrap on Sports News. It's back to Melinda with the wrap of the News at 10. Thank you for watching. I'm Victor Mathias. Many thanks, Victor.
Pope Francis has named the Bishop of Ecolobia, Peter Opaleke, and 20 others as new cardinals. Most of them are from continents other than Europe, which dominated Catholic hierarchy for most of the church's history and further putting his mark on the group of people who might someday elect the next pontiff. Sixteen of those who will receive the prestigious Red Cardinal's hat from Pope Francis in a ceremony at the Vatican are younger than 80 and would now be eligible to vote for his successor if a conclave in which pontiffs are secretly elected were to be held. The Prime Minister of Pakistan says the magnitude of the flood disaster that hit his country is bigger than expected. Mr. Shabazz Sharif was speaking after visiting the flood hit areas today. The floods have killed nearly a thousand people across Pakistan since June, while thousands others have been displaced. The Pakistani government has launched flood rescue and relief efforts across the country as it struggles to cope with historic monsoon rains which has swept away buildings and submerged cities. The floods have affected more than 30 million people over the last two weeks, according to the country's climate change minister who has described the situation as a climate-induced humanitarian disaster of epic proportions. But rescue and relief efforts are being hampered by the destruction of infrastructure and breakdown in communication links. At least one person has been injured after a Russian S-300 rocket hit a residential area of Kharkiv earlier today. The strike hit a street in the region's no military zone. Only residential buildings with regular citizens were near the place of impact. Russia has repeatedly denied targeting civilian areas after launching what it calls a special military operation in February, despite mounting evidence that its missiles have hit residential areas across the country. And the main news again. Outrage today trailed the continued gridlock on the Lagos Ibadan Expressway as residents of Isheria State protested against the dangers created by the road reconstruction. Federal Ministry of Works appealed for patience. That's the news at 10 tonight. I'm Melinda Kinlami. On behalf of the team, good night.